Okie doke. Well, we are um, continuing through the Gospel of John for the Cartersville First Baptist Wednesday night men's class, and there seems to be a lot of conflicts. I think we've got deacons meetings and groups meeting, and all of these are really good things. So there's some guys missing tonight, and that's okay. We're just going to record. We're going to start on John chapter 4, talking about Jesus and the woman at the well, which is a well-known story. Um, and we're just going to, we're going to probably break it up into two pieces because it's a big story and I don't want us to overrun tonight. And if we do run out of story before we run out of time, that's good too. We'll just spend some time in prayer and, um, and then meet back again next week. So how about I'll uh, open us in prayer and then we'll jump into the word and do some reading. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for this time. I look forward to this every week because we get to spend time together as men in the Word, and that's a special thing. This is not something that's available to everyone in the world, and even in the midst of this weirdness that is COVID-19, we can still meet together um, on the internet, and uh, although I look forward to the, to the day that we can meet together um, in class and hug each other's necks and shake hands. And, and be close together, be in proximity, be in a place that's set aside for the study of God's Word. So Lord, I pray that you would bless this time, that you would open our eyes to understand the Scriptures, and that you would use it to save and to sanctify, like you always do. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so last week, um, we were finishing up John chapter 3, and I wanted to do just a little bit of a review from John chapter 3. Um, so let's see, dad, do you were, were you here last week, dad? You were out, you were at the, the leadership meeting and you're muted, so I can't hear you. Um, so last week was, uh, sort of the last big block of conversation that we see from John the Baptist, but John the Baptist, if we remember, he's, he looks like this. He's got on his, his camel hair outfit here and he, um, he had these disciples that got into a dispute with a Jew over um, the means of baptism, who they were baptized into. These fellows were uh, disciples of John the Baptist, and they came to him worried that Jesus was becoming more popular than he was. And he spent a little bit of time taking a, a moment to make that a teaching opportunity for them to correct them in their understanding of his relationship to Christ, who, what his role was, what Christ's role was, and how ultimately Christ's ministry must increase. He said, but I must decrease. And so this happens um, in, in, a, in a period where Jesus and his disciples are um, in the, the highways and byways of Judea. So we're going to do a little geographical review here because it's going to come into our story again. And I think it's good to sort of follow around on a map as Jesus and his disciples go and do things. It gives us a sense of place. All of this happened in a real place and a real time. These aren't just nice moral stories. Um, this, this is history happening that we're reading here. So here, this is our, our Sea of Galilee and the River Jordan. We, we had started off our story in Bethany on the Jordan River, and then Jesus went up into Galilee to a city called Cana. Cana is where he turned water into wine. He dropped down to Capernaum for just a few days before going down to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is where the Passover feast was held. Jerusalem, I can't spell the name. And that's also where he met Nicodemus. They had their conversation at night. And this was in a, a region called Judea. Judea is sort of this region right here. And then between Judea and Galilee is a region called Samaria. And that's where our story is going to pick up today. So um, how about, Dad, your audio works and, and I can read too. So how about you and I just trade reading, and the rest of you who are listening in can just follow along. I want for us to read John chapter 4, and we'll just read straight through um, to verse 26. And then next week, we'll read 
um, the rest of this particular story. But we're going to stop at verse 26 today. So how about, Dad, if you'll read verses 1 through 15, and then I'll read 16 through 26. All right, here we go. <clears throat> now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. When he had passed through some, and, the, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you are that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Very good. So let, let's look at this, starting from um, this first paragraph here in John ch chapter 4. Um, this is following right there on the tail of this conversation that John the Baptist has with his disciples. And their concern is that Jesus is becoming more popular and baptizing more people. And more, it, it, they, even, they even sort of, they, they use a little hyperbole. They say all are going to him. Well, it, it seems that it's not just John's disciples that are concerned about this. It's also the Pharisees. So the Pharisees are concerned that this sort of, in their mind, radical rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth is gathering many disciples, and they're worried about this. Could this upset the order of things? And so this is not really the time for Jesus to get into conflict with them about this. And so he, he just up and leaves. Um, it says that 
he, he leaves because the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making um, and baptizing more disciples than John. And then there's this distinction made here. It says, um, who was baptizing? Was it Jesus who was baptizing or was it his disciples? Right there in John chapter 4, verse 2, there's a little parenthetical comment. Yeah, it, it said it wasn't Jesus who was doing it, it was his disciples. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's not Jesus baptizing, but his disciples. And so, um, you know, the, one of the points to, to see here is that this is sort of in, in con, not really in conflict, but a clarification of what was in um, John chapter 3, where it said that Jesus was there and was baptizing and all were going to him. That it was not actually Jesus baptizing. He was focusing his efforts on teaching the people, on, on being with them and teaching them. And then those who wanted to follow him, who were turning back to God, the disciples would baptize. So, um, but he leaves. It says he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And look over here at our map on the left. If you want to get from Judea to Galilee, you've got to go through this area called Samaria. Now, there's some background knowledge here, and it's hinted at um, almost, um, it, it's, it's almost not given enough strength in, in the, the next few verses. But this region of Samaria um, is a place that the Jews don't really like to go through. Um, a little bit of a history lesson. When Israel was taken captive and taken into exile in Babylon, the Babylonians left a bunch of people in this area called Samaria. They just left them there. They didn't take them with them. Well, they stayed, and some things happened that changed their culture with respect to the rest of the Jewish culture. They began to intermarry into the other nations of the area. They began to worship some of those false gods. They began to reject some of the scriptures that the other Israelites um, accepted. And so these, these people of Samaria, Samaria was just the capital city, and then eventually that name came to be known for the whole region there. The Samaritans who lived there were considered to be um, second-class citizens to the Jews. They were sort of like these interbred, um, not-quite-right people because they had turned after other gods, and they had intermarried with the other nations around them. And they fought over a lot of theological issues. They got in big fights over this. So that's going to come up. But one of the things I wanted to point out was is if you want to get from Judea to Galilee, there's really three roads. And I'm going to sort of blow up um, Samaria over here in the middle. And let's say this is Jerusalem. And I want to get, this is, you know, in, in Judea. And I want to get from here up to Galilee. This is a little bit bigger. Here's our Jordan River again. And what, what you need to know is that on this map, there's these mountain ranges, kind of like this. They, they kind of stretch a little bit like this. So there's really three paths for you to take. You can kind of go around up the Jordan River on this side to get to Galilee. You can hang west and go this way around the mountains, or you can just drive straight through Samaria. And if you were to go around Samaria in order to avoid the people there, it would have added multiple days to this journey. Uh, now, something to note here is scale-wise, I mean, we're talking about tens of miles. This is like 40 or 50 miles to get across this. Uh, but to them, that was a good three days journey. Uh, you know, for us, that would take minutes because we're in cars. They're on foot. So and this is a multi-day journey. And so Jesus and his disciples decide to go straight through Samaria. And that way, they're not cutting off anything else. Uh, another thing to note here is that um, in verse 4, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Well, these roads over here on the east and the west, they existed. He could have taken those paths, but it says he had to go through Samaria. In the King James, it says he must needs go through Samaria. Well, why did he have to do it? 
And I think why he had to do it was because he had to get here to this little place called Sychar. I can't spell a thing tonight. Let me erase that again. Sychar was a city sort of smack dab in the middle of Samaria. And that's where this scene takes place, is in Sychar. And uh, let's pick up reading again. It says in verse 5, So he came to a, a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Now, which Jacob is this? Who is this guy, Jacob? Dad, do you know? I, I, he's... Abraham's son. This is Jacob, Abraham's son. Um, this is this is this is Isaac's son, right? Yep. Oh, sorry. Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and and Jacob, uh, whose name means to grasp the heel. That's a Hebrew idiom for to deceive. And that's what he was. I and mean, even his family taught him to be a deceiver. He came from a family of liars. We could read a lot about that in the Old Testament. This is the man who wrestled with God in the night, um, literally, and God gives him a new name, and that new name is Israel. So this guy, he's a pretty important guy in history here. And in this town of Sychar, nearby that is a field this field was one that Jacob passed down to his son, Joseph, and in that field is, um, let's see, Jacob's well was there, there in the town. And this is a well that, um, when we think, when I think of a well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change pictures now. When I think of a well, I think of, you know, what you see in somebody's yard, like a little wishing well, kind of goes like this. You know, this is stuff you see in fairy tales, and it's got a little roof over it so that you don't get dirt down in there, and maybe it's got a winch with a bucket to lower stuff down, and that's cute, but that's not really what this looks like. I, I read one account that somebody said, um, you know, what it was was there was a, a large sort of stone that covered a hole, and you had to go down into the hole to get to the well, you had to go down here. And then from here, then you had to lower a rope that was at least, uh, it was anywhere between like, sorry, that's not even on the screen. It's uh, anywhere from 30 to 90 feet, just to get to the bottom where the water was. It was only five feet deep at that point. And this hole right here was big enough for many men to stand in. So they could go way down and dig a lot. This is a massive well. And Jesus comes over and he sits here by the well. So here's, here's Jesus and he's sitting by the well. And, um, and in verse six, it says, so Jesus wearied as he was from his journey was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. So some things to note here is they've been traveling now for at least one day, this is probably the second day of their journey, if it takes three days to get from Judea to Galilee. And they've been doing this on foot. So if you've hiked all day long, and then you're going to hike some more the next day, you could imagine he's tired. Well, why do we care if he's tired? We care because Jesus was a real man. He was fully man. He was not a superhuman man. He had actual weaknesses. This is, you know, so I, what I, when I draw uh, Jesus here, sometimes we draw epic hair Jesus, and he's, he's got those flowing locks like you see him on TV, and perfect face, and he's, you know, slight muscular build, and guess what? He got tired. This isn't like Thor walking through, you know, the land of Samaria where he'd never get tired and just keep on going. This is Jesus, a real man. He goes and he sits by the well, and it's about the sixth hour. So uh, according to the Hebrew recounting of time, um, they didn't start their day at midnight. They didn't divvy it up by midnight and noon like we do. Um, that's the Roman accounting of time. So they did it from sunrise to sunset, and that was about a 12-hour period. Well, so if sunrise, which is about 6 a.m., is that's that's sort of like the zero point for them. What's well, then? What would be the sixth hour from that? It would be 
12 noon. I always write 12 noon because I never know if you're supposed to call that 12 a.m. or 12 p.m. But if I say 12 noon, then everybody knows what that is. So this is about lunchtime. And so this is time for them to rest and eat. And he comes and sits by this well, but it's just him. And we'll find out why in just a minute. So, uh, Dad, can you reread for us, uh, let's see, verses 7 through 9. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Very good. So now we get a new character who has entered the scene. There's a woman who comes, and she has come to draw water from this well that is super deep and um, was carved by their great, 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 great grandfather, Jacob. Well, she shows up, and Jesus makes a very simple request to her. Give me something to drink. Um, and she is surprised by this. She's unsure of his intentions. She says, well, wait a minute now, All right? Something's got to be going on because I can look at you and see that you're different. She says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? So she recognizes either by, and I had a couple different opinions here by different commentators, either by his, his mode of dress, uh, it's possible that the Samaritans and the Jews just dress differently. It's sort of like how in our country, there's multiple subcultures and they all dress differently. You know, I wear cargo shorts and there's a lot of folks that wouldn't be caught dead in cargo shorts, right? Uh, there's other people who have different jobs and we see that they're dressed differently. Like, for example, a, a priest, a Catholic priest, even in their, when they're dressed down, they'll have that collar that we can immediately spot that they're a priest. Well, it's not un, un, impossible for us to, um, to think that a Jew, and especially a rabbi like Jesus, may have had a mode of dress that sort of called attention to who he was, and she would have recognized that. Uh, another option there is that his dialect may have been different. Remember, he grew up in Galilee, that's where he's from, and she's from Samaria, they likely spoke different dialects of the Hebrew language, just like even in America, we speak different dialects of English. So she recognizes that he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan. Now, there's also this idea that she's a woman and he's a man, and he's approached her with this request. And there's sort of a, an awkwardness here that doesn't really come out until he challenges her. There is a woman here who has come alone to the well in the middle of the day at the hottest part of the day. And I want us to note that she's come alone in the middle of the day to draw some water. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pick that back up in just a minute. But I want to touch a little bit more here. She says, um, you know, why are you asking for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John, the evangelist, provides for us a little parenthetical comment here. For the Jews have no dealings with uh, the Samaritans. And this is, this is almost an understatement. Um, they hated each other's guts is probably the best way to put this. In other words, they would not have even spoken. Jews would have walked through this town hoping that they had packed enough food that they don't even have to stop to buy food that has been cooked by a Samaritan. Like Dad, you got your hand raised. Like the conflict in the story of the Good Samaritan. Yes, yes, like that conflict. You want to you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, uh, you've got three Jews. You've got three Jews going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and all of them, no, no matter what their occupation is, they all pass him by because they didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritan for whatever their reasons were. They could apparently look at this guy who'd been stripped and beaten and still tell that he was a Samaritan. Wait a minute. Was he a Samaritan or was the guy that helped him a Samaritan? I mean, excuse me. 
the guy, see, that's the second thing I've gotten wrong tonight. You've only asked me two questions. The only guy to help him was the Samaritan. He and the, the three that passed the guy who'd been beaten um, didn't want to have anything to do with him. But the Samaritan didn't is the one who didn't care. But the only reason I bring it up in this context is because um, it, too, highlighted the hatred between Samaritans and the people of the, the nation of Israel. Right. Or when Jesus told that parable, the, the, the punchline to the parable almost was that the hero of the story was somebody that the Jews did not want to recognize as being a hero that this good Samaritan who helped the man who was hurt, um, he, when he said, who was a neighbor to the man, they didn't even want to say a Samaritan. They didn't even respond that way. They said the one who helped him because they didn't want to admit that he, it was a Samaritan that did something that was good. Th this is a cultural, um, deep down ingrained parents teaching their children. You don't talk to Samaritans, businessmen on trips, um, intentionally avoiding these regions. Um, somebody who cooked food, who was a Samaritan, you didn't eat with them. You don't do business with them. That's the kind of hatred between them. So this no dealings, uh, I don't want to underplay that. This was a big deal. And we see that Jesus has intentionally put himself here now in the midst of an obvious cultural um, uh, hostility so that he can have a conversation with a particular person. Uh, as we're going to continue to see through the Gospel of John, what we see here are not general teachings of Jesus, like as what's covered in some of the other synoptic Gospels. Here we see individual conversations that Jesus has with individual people about things. And here he's going to reveal something to her that he hasn't even revealed to his own disciples in so many words. So this is a special occasion. And she is unsure of his intention. She, she challenges him. So in verse 10, Jesus answers her. And he says, because remember, he just asked her for a drink. And she says, what? And he says, okay, well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, meaning himself, and he would have given you living water. So, first of all, he uses this phrase, gift of God. Um, and, and, and what is this gift of God? Salvation. Mm -hmm. This gift of God is salvation. This is, a, this is a free gift, salvation by Jesus Christ. He's referring to himself. And he's using a phrase here that she would... She, she's not even going to pick up on. She doesn't know the context. But he says it, and then he says, if you did know that, which means if you really did know me, if you really knew who I was, if you knew what I was about and what I was here for, where I came from and where I'm going back to, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. Now, this, this phrase, living water, we hear that, and if you've been in the church for a long time, you may have heard this phrase, and you go, oh, living water, man, that's the Spirit poured out for salvation. Man, I get that. But this was a phrase they already had, and it meant something in particular. So um, you, you can imagine the difference between, I'm going to draw this um, garden well. Um, down here in this garden well, is water that is stagnant. It's down here, it kind of seeps in, but it sits there, all right? And well water, if you've ever drank well water, doesn't always taste that fresh, okay? It's got a little well water taste to it. So they call this dead water. I'm drawing behind my face again. Let's, let's draw living water over it. Living water to them was moving water. So, so here's a river. If you go into a river and you were to dip some water out of the river with a bucket, for example, um, they would call this living water. So he's using a phrase that she would not have necessarily thought, oh, he's talking about spiritual things. Instead, she would have gone, oh, you've got something that tastes better than well water? Ah, well, that's good. But then she scratches her head. And she says back to him, 
in verse 11, the woman said to him, uh, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the only body around here of water is the well, which I wouldn't call living water. She says, but the well is deep and you don't even have anything to draw water with. So where do you get that living water? She's confused because this is a phrase she would have known. And I'm looking around. I don't see a spring where I could get fresh water. So where are you going to get it? In verse 12, she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So Jacob dug this well for a purpose, and it's not, um, it, it was a common thing in that day that if you dug a well, which was of great expense and effort, um, to feed other people, not just yourself, but to give water to people of that region, and it lasted a long time, it was sort of like you became famous. The wells were always named after the person who dug them. They were sort of like patriarchs of the region. Well, here she's in Samaria, and if we remember, Samaria is a region of Israel, and she was ultimately a descendant of Jacob. Now, she was in this group that was rejected by the Israelites, but when she says, our father Jacob, she's not making a claim that wasn't true. Ultimately, the Samaritans were descended from Israel, just like the rest of the Jews were. He gave us this well and drank from it himself. In other words, he went to great effort and expense to dig this. And you've walked up and you don't have anything to even draw water. And I don't see any other bodies of water. It's just this well. That's the reason why the well's here, by the way, or we would have been going to a spring if it was closer. So are you, you greater than him? I mean, are you about to perform something that's unbelievable here? And he says, okay, well, you're still thinking from a, I'm actually talking about water perspective. And you're not realizing that I'm using water as a word picture here. So he says, so let's clarify. Dad, can you reread for us uh, verses 13 through 15? Oh, sorry, you're muted. So anticlimactic. You missed the best part. I know. You got to do it again, but it won't be as good. <laughs> Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come to here, come here to draw water. Good. So he continues with the word picture of water, but he clarifies it to try and push it into a spiritual context. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. In other words, you're concerned about something that is earthly. You're concerned with the shadow in this picture, not the thing that is signified by the shadow. So he says, in contrast to that, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. So there is something supernatural. I mean, this, this never thirsty again points to something that is not natural water. This is, a, this is a supernatural concept. Never thirsty again is like, wow, I mean, that's, I've never drank water that's like that before. And then he says, the water I give him will become in him, and I want to write that down here, in him. Hey, Matt, I see you over there. Better late than never, man. All right, we'll take you when we can get you. We're in John chapter 4, and we're, we're right here in verses 13 through 15. We're talking about the woman at the well. Okay. Uh, so you can, you can just pick right up where we are. So he uses this word, in him. Um, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Well, here, this water that he's talking about is the, the outpouring of the Spirit into a person who is saved, somebody who is converted to Jesus, somebody who accepts his gift of, his free gift of salvation. 
um, the Spirit is poured into them and is a source of eternal life for that person. Their sins are washed away. They, um, they are, in God's eyes, uh, they become white as snow in comparison to the filthiness of their sin. And this spring of water in him wells up to eternal life. This is not something that happens to your outside. This is something that happens in you and to you. And, um, and that's, where, that's where Christ needs to be. It, Christ doesn't need to be an, an external thing to you. He's not a moral teacher that you follow. This is something that you say, no, I want Jesus to be in every part of me. You know, I want him to be Lord of my life, and I want him to change me from the inside out. Well, she is now definitely interested in what he's selling, but she doesn't fully understand what he means. But he's going to keep going. So her response, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. What you can tell from her response, she's still thinking, this is some physical water, but it's got some magical properties that's going to save me some time and and that it never be thirsty again. I live in the desert. That sounds great. Well, he then gives her, throws her a curveball. In verse 16, Jesus says to her, go, call your husband and come here. Well, this isn't like a situation where he's worried that he's going to be spending too much time with somebody else's wife. Instead, this is a situation where he's trying to get her to realize her position in relation to God. He wants to, in other words, there's this phrase that you can't, you can't, um, you, you can't get somebody saved. Uh, until first you get them lost. Which sounds really Southern. Okay, but in other words, if they don't understand their lost condition, then they're not going to understand why they need salvation. Salvation is like, saved from what? I enjoy my life. I get to do all sorts of things that I like to do. I feel good about it. Uh, sin does feel good when you do it. The fruits of it are death. Uh, the consequences of it often don't feel good, but in the moment, it feels great. Well, unless you understand that you're lost, unless you understand how high and righteous God is and how low and abased and corrupt your own heart is and the magnanimous distance between the two, then you won't know why you need help crossing that divide. So he asks her one simple question, go call your husband. Well, he already knows what the situation is here. He's trying to get her to admit it. And she does. In verse 17, the woman answers him and says, I have no husband, which is true. She had no husband. But it's a little deeper than that. So Jesus says to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Well, there's a number of reasons why this could have happened. Uh, one is that in those days, it was commonly acceptable for the husband to divorce his wife for really any reason. All he had to do was claim something about her that he didn't like. So she, she could have just been um, divorced five times by fickle husbands. In other words, she could have cooked them a meal that uh, they didn't particularly enjoy, and they were tired of her anyway, so he used that as grounds for divorce. However, it's also possible that she was divorced for legitimate reasons. If she's the one who's had five husbands, it's possible that she had slept around on them, that she had uh, spent some time with other people's husbands, and because of her unfaithfulness, been divorced as a result. There's sort of a, a, a sense in which um, we get hints that this may have been, it could have been unfaithful. We get a sense in which there's some supporting evidence here. Jesus says, the one that you have now 
is not your husband. In other words, she's had five husbands before that she was legally married to, and the man she's living with now, she's not legally married to. So if that's the case, if she's what, to quote, to quote Downton Abbey here, uh, if she's a woman of ill repute, that could explain why she came to the well by herself in the middle of the day in the hottest part of the day. See, the well is sort of like the, the, the watering hole of the community. Um, it's sort of like, um, what do we call it, the, the, the water cooler at work. You know, when, when guys and gals get together at the water cooler, they go to get a drink of water and they just kind of stand around and talk and socialize. That this was a place that women came to, um, and I'm gonna draw ladies with long hair here. Women came to, to, yes, to get water, that was part of their job as running the household and doing some of those things, but they would come in groups. They would come and spend time with each other. Hey, I'm going down to get some water. You wanna come with me? And they would go and walk and talk. And ladies still do that now. Um, they just do it and they don't go to the well, they just go to different places. And here she comes alone. She doesn't go in the morning when it's cooler. She doesn't go in the evening when it's cooler. She's come in the hottest part of the day when nobody else is there because it's likely that they would not have wanted her to be there. She was not a favorite among the people. She was somebody who was unfaithful to her husbands. Well, Jesus has just gotten her to admit it. She's admitted, I have no husband, and he corrects her and says, well, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. And you can imagine how she's feeling at that moment. Like she's been caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Like, oh, you know about my sin and you're calling me to account for it. And I'm feeling a little guilty for it. And she pulls um, a stunt like, like I've seen other people do when you present them with something uncomfortable. Any gospel presentation that doesn't talk about the problem of sin doesn't really cover the whole thing. But when you do bring up sin, oh, now you're stepping on toes. We got a real problem here. Well, she responds by changing the subject. In verse 19, the woman says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You, I don't know you, but you know a lot about me. Clearly, this has been revealed to you. So why don't we talk about something else now? She says, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. She points to the nearby mountain. We'll talk about that in a second. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So we've gone from water cooler talk about, hey, can you give me a drink? Well, why should I give you a drink? Well, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. And we're still talking about water and drinks. And then we're talking about sin for a minute there. And she goes, uh-oh. I'm going to talk about something really deep and theological because clearly you are a prophet and I don't want to talk about my sin anymore. And so it's sort of like when you go to somebody and, and you start to talk to them about the gospel and about sin and about how their, their need for a savior. And they go, they pull a hard left and they go, Oh, I tell you what, instead of talking about that, let's talk about something spiritual and deeply theological that we can get in conflict over, and then we can just part on dis a disagreement over that. An example of that is, um, I heard a story of a man that, um, you know, when presented with uh, his sin and presented with the gospel, he says, well, you know, I, I get all that you're saying, and I know it's based on the Bible, but I've got these problems, these conflicts in the Bible, these unanswered questions, and that's why I can't accept it. And, and the, the man presenting said, well, well, give me an example. And he said, well, let, let's take, for example, you know, Cain. You remember Cain in the Bible? He killed his brother Abel, and then he was kicked out and sent out into the wilderness. And then, then he got married, and he fathered a whole city and nation. And Except, who did he get married to, right? Because it doesn't say that there were any other women there to get married to. So I just, I just can't believe that. Like, I don't understand how that can work. And the person then responds and says, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get that. But if that's the case, if that's the reason why you don't want to accept, then you're not going to be the only man that misses out on heaven because he was worried about somebody else's wife. Okay. All right. So 
So that's what she's done here. She's pulled a hard left and she says, let's talk about something deep and theological. Well, he, he doesn't miss a beat. He, Jesus does not miss a beat. She points up to this mountain, by the way. This mountain is Mount Gerizim. Um, draw it on the map here. We had, we had these, these mountains here in Samaria. And Sychar was right here in the middle. Sychar. And right next to Sychar is this Mount Gerizim. I'm going to just write the letter G. On Mount Gerizim, uh, a king built a temple there for the Samaritans to worship at. And in the past, they had also worshipped other false gods. That was cleared out. By the time Jesus came to this town, uh, worship was still going on on Mount Gerizim, and they were the same kind of worship services that were going on in the temple at Jerusalem. But because they had these theological differences about where to worship and how to worship, the Samaritans only accepted the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, so their worship was not uh, influenced by the rest of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, and so she, she pulls out like the main disagreement point between Jews and Samaritans on worship. Where do you do it? Do you do it in Jerusalem or do you do it on this mountain? And she could literally point to it because it's right there next to Sychar. Jesus says, woman, believe me. Woman, believe me. In verse 21, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He just pulls the rug out from under her feet. He says, look, that's what you want to get in a disagreement about? Well, let me tell you something. Where you worship is not the problem. Where you worship is not the problem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And this is true. Jesus was born a Jew. Ultimately, all of Jewish history was intended to lead up to the coming of Christ. That's where the salvation comes from. But the hour is coming and is now here. This is one of those uh, already and not yet kind of things we continue, we'll continue to see in the New Testament. Um, that the kingdom has started, but it will not be fully consummated until later. So this is the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. He says, the problem here that I need you to understand is that it's not which temple you worship in that matters. That's, that's sort of like, it, it, it's sort of like the letter of the law is the problem. It's sort of like the mode of the, of the worship is the problem. Maybe the words that we say is the problem. Maybe it's the way we dress when we go to church that's the problem. Maybe it's uh, it, we're doing the worship in the wrong way. Was worship very strictly prescribed in the Old Testament as to how to do it? Yes, and for, for a specific purpose. But the point Jesus was making was that all of that was about to fade away. His very presence inaugurated the fading away of the old order of Jewish worship. All of that, ultimately, the system of sacrifices, the means of worship, pointed to him. And when he made the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, all those other pictures pointing to the cross weren't needed anymore. That's why we don't continue to do sacrifices today. So he said, that's coming. And that's when you're really going to get it, that the worship of God is spiritual. He is spirit. He is not a bird in the sky. He's not a carved wooden image. He's not a fancy gold uh, cow. He's not, well, everything, everything is God, that kind of thing. No, God is spirit, and he's spirit in a way that he's an infinite, uh, all-powerful God. He is everywhere. He takes up all space. There's nowhere in anywhere that God is not there. There's nowhere in the universe that God does not is not sovereign over. Um, and those who worship him, therefore, must worship him in spirit and truth. And so she tried to get in a disagreement to get away from uncomfortable talk. And now he's making her feel like she didn't understand any of this in the first place. And so she says, she sort of does a shrug kind of thing. She says, well, I know that Messiah is coming. In other words, you and I are just not going to agree on this, but there's this guy, Messiah. I know that Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. 
Well, this is interesting because most of the Old Testament scriptures that pointed clearly to Christ, that they, they pointed to one who was coming, uh, one, one who was the son of God, one who was the son of man who would be coming, the, the suffering servant scriptures that point to Christ's coming. Um, the, uh, the, the, the one who would come as a descendant of David, who would be born in Bethlehem, all of those scriptures are outside the Pentateuch, and they only, the Samaritans only accepted the Pentateuch, but it was so common that all the Israelites outside of Samaria were looking for a Messiah, that it became common for the Samaritans to go, oh, well, I know, I've heard about this guy, this Messiah, that he's coming. And so she pulls that out as sort of like a, well, we're just going to agree to disagree, but that's okay because a guy's going to come later and he's going to explain it all to us about which one's right and who's going to win overall. And she's, she's, it's almost like she's shrugging and backing away. They're sort of like this, um, I'm going to, I'm going to draw her here. And she's, she's got her hands up like, you know, eh, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm sort of done here. And then, then he drops a bomb on her. And we're going to talk about this some more next week because we're out of time. He says, I who speak to you am he. And this is the first time in the book of John that Jesus has actually made the claim that he is the Messiah. And he didn't do it on a loudspeaker. He didn't post it on Twitter for the whole world to see. He said it to one woman who came alone to a well in the middle of the day because she was a social outcast. And that's who he actually claimed out loud in words to, I am the Messiah. And next week, we'll finish the rest of the story because the disciples who have gone to get food are going to come back. And they're going to be a little confused about the situation that they walk up to. And Jesus is going to teach them another lesson about all of this, about the reason why he's there. But I want you to think on that over the next week about, man, every time we see Jesus taking these steps in his ministry, it's never a big thing. It's a little slow thing that he started off with here. You know, his first miracle, uh, the only people who even noticed that it was a miracle was like a handful. Not even everybody at the party he was at realized he had performed a miracle. And here he's making a claim that he's the Messiah, and he's only told it to one person. Nobody else around, not even his disciples. That's wild to me. And beautiful, I think. So we'll talk about that some more next week. Thoughts, questions? Everybody's muted, so y'all have to unmute to talk. Did you, uh, hey Scott, did you hey. record it? I did record it. So I can go back, okay, cool. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Um, the, the, the first observation that I had about uh, tonight's lesson was the simplicity from which a testimony can be given. The simplicity of, I mean, he just sat by the well and waited for her to come, and the conversation went from what she was there to do. Mm -hmm. It gives me pause to think about ways to actively witness instead of the ways I've been trying to witness. Mm -hmm. And um, how many other how many opportunities have I missed because I was more concerned about a way to get the, the job done than to simply use what I've been given in the circumstances in which I'm set, the circumstances that have been given to me. Um, a, a question then would be asked, can we give living water? And before anybody speculates too much on that, my answer is yes. And the reason my answer is yes is because um, so much of the time in we, 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 and I don't know where the reference is, but uh, we've heard about washing with the word. Mm 
washing with the word, such that the word of God is the water that not only it, cl it cleanses and it hydrates and it does the work of water in physical life. Mm -hmm. So we can give living water. We may not be giving, that, that, that doesn't mean somebody's going to drink it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus said that he was the Messiah, he didn't say that he was, even though he said he's living water, he didn't make that point to her in this one. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's any th reason that we should have to object to the fact or to the observation that we can give living water to someone else in, in, an, oppor in an opportunity to witness or give testimony. Yeah. I mean, from that, from that definition, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we, we have that water and we can share it. Now, I can't give somebody the Spirit. I can't pour out the Spirit. That's not my job to give. But that's not what I'm commanded to do. I'm commanded to share the Word and then let the Spirit do His work. He's going to be all about doing His work if we're out there sharing the Word. So, absolutely. Now, talking about the simplicity there, you know, the times that I know God has used me probably the most effectively to witness have been very simple situations. I wasn't knocking on doors. I wasn't passing out tracks um, or, or any of those things. I wasn't following the Romans road. I, I remember I had a, um, I went to a work retreat in Lake Tahoe and at one particular dinner, uh, we were looking out over the lake and the sun was setting and the weather was perfect. And there was a coworker of mine sitting on the balcony, looking out at the sunset and he was alone and I just went to sit with him. And we just began to talk, and it, it, it was sort of like so easy for me to say, look out at everything in front of us and how beautiful and perfect and glorious it is. It is so clear to me that this is not an accident. This is a beautiful work that somebody did by design. It's not rolled up on accident. This happened with a purpose, and it reflects the glory of God. And I could turn it immediately from, look, there's a sunset. Hey, let's talk about God. Hey, let's talk about Jesus. Um, and it didn't have to be an awkward, memorized kind of thing, which is good, because I'm so bad at memorizing that I would just get it wrong every time. You know, Working the things of God into everyday conversation is exactly what Jesus was doing here. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Well, I'm glad that each of you came. Um, I want to tell each of you that I love you. Um, that's, that's something that I want to say because I, I'm not there to hug your neck or, or shake your hand and, and touch you in that way. Uh, because we're separated still, and it may be a while before we, we even see each other at church again. But as brothers, and maybe even, I don't know how many Luke's friends are there, um, maybe even sisters of Christ in this room, um, I love you, and I want you to hear that, and know that that you're loved, and I, I pray for y'all. Um, and y'all are special to me in that way. So, um, Matt, you came in late. That means you have to close this in prayer. Can you do that? Do you still do you still love me though? You know I love you. I know, man. Like, you I know love I love you. Seriously. And I'll take you even if you That's were right. here for, for five minutes. I would take you. <laughs> well, I, I'll be glad to pray, but I'm gonna pray with my eyes open because I'm driving. Oh, please do. Yes. Um, dear Heavenly Father, what a, dear Heavenly Father, what, thank you so much for uh this, this time that we have together as men to, to gather and, and learn more about the many layers, the many facets of your love and your salvation. Thank you that you loved us first, God. And no matter how hard I try, God, I can't love you as much as you love me. I'm grateful for that. Thank you for that. I praise you for that. Thank you for Scott and his uh, 
his stance and thank you for his knowledge of your word, God. And I, I pray for him and I pray for all the other guys and their families on this call that you will surround them and lift them up and uh, shelter them, protect them, and make them godly men. Help us to always keep our eyes on you, Jesus. Love you and thank you for all you've done and what you continue to do in our lives. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Later. Have a good one. Bye.